All right, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So today we're going to have a really great deep Bible study on the life of Abraham. You know, we're going to look at a specific moment in Abraham's life. So if you're following with us, please turn to Genesis 22. Otherwise, I have typed up the sermon notes. So if you're visiting and you would like them, please talk to the person who invited you and we'll send them to you. Yes. You know, at this particular time in Abraham's life, we see that Abraham is given a test from God that seems very ungodlike. Yes. Right. It seems like something that God wouldn't do. Right. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's first introduce Abraham. Who was he at this particular time? So Abraham is pictured with many various characteristics in the Bible. He's described as a righteous man with a wholehearted conviction and faith and commitment to God. You know, and as Christians, as disciples, this is what we want to be described as. Someone who has a wholehearted faith and commitment to God. You know, he's described as a man of peace when he settled a boundary dispute with his nephew Lot. He's described as someone who is compassionate when he argues and bargains with God to spare the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's described as someone who is hospitable to people, to strangers. When he sees these three guys walking around, he's like, please come in, let me feed you, let me clothe, let me shelter you. And then he found out that these three people are in fact angels. He is described as a quick acting warrior who defends his family. You know, he rescues his nephew Lot and Lot's family from a raiding party, but he acted immediately. He didn't hesitate or have fear. He was like, they're in trouble. I'm going to rescue them. You know, Abraham is described as a great man, but like all great men, they aren't perfect because they're not Jesus. Only Jesus is the perfect one. You know, unfortunately, there's a time in Abraham's life where he becomes a coward and a liar yeah. after giving it to the fear of death. Right. Mm-hmm. He's in, confronted with the uh, Pharaoh, Egyptian Pharaoh, yeah. and he tells, his, he tells Pharaoh that his wife is actually his sister yeah. and he lets her be taken by her. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but if anyone tried to take Liz, <laughs> I'd pity the fool. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they, would, they wouldn't take her away from me. <laughs> But we can see that he appears as both a great man of spiritual faith and strength in God, but also a man who has some relatable moments of weakness. And you know what? You may relate to Abraham's moment of weakness. Like when someone struggles for a day, it's like, I understand. I've struggled with that too. But can you relate to Abraham's great faith? You know, anyone can relate to someone who has weakness. We all have weakness. But sadly, not everyone can relate to someone who has great faith. So how is your faith today? Would the Bible describe you as having great faith like Abraham? Or would it describe you as a great flop? You know, I think about some people who have great faith in the church. Think about Denzel. (laughs) Denzel, he's he's been a Christian for like five months, right? Or maybe less than. But Denzel, like a couple weeks ago, he got up here and preached a fantastic sermon. (coughs) And the thing is, he had a week to prepare it. One week to prepare that great sermon. And I, you know, we were talking about it because this week he led Bible talk and it was fantastic. And he was like, you know, I'm considering like what my future would be. Maybe I could be an intern for the church. Maybe I could do this. I'm like, wow, this guy has great faith. But I asked him, we were talking about how he was so uh, competent for one week to create such a fantastic sermon. And he goes, you know what, it was tough, but I just say yes to every single opportunity that I get to serve God. Because that means that I will grow the most. That's someone with great faith. You know, today we'll be going through one of the toughest parts in Abraham's life. We're going to talk about the day he was told by God to sacrifice his only son as an offering. Just stop for a second. Can you imagine being told to do this? Your only son. And God says, kill him. What would you do? You know, Jackie got up here and talked about how his cats are incredibly valuable. But imagine that, right? So imagine I got a little kitten and you know, you called it Mr. Cucumber or whatever. And I gave it to Jackie and Grace is there and she's like, oh, it's the perfect cat. 
so cute, cuddles up to you, purrs and everything. And then I go to him the next day and it's like, how's the cat? How's Mr. Cucumber? And he goes, ah, oh, it's awesome. This cat, I love this cat. I'm like, great, now kill it. Oh, wow. Can you imagine the type of feelings you would have towards God when he says, kill your son after I just gave it to you? You know, the Bible says that Abraham was 100 years old when he had his son was born. Which means for about 80 years, he wrestled with the fact that maybe I might not have a son. For 80 years, that dream was there and then he just got it. Not only this, but we'll see that he was going to kill not only his son, but his wife's dream as well. You know, it's one thing to sacrifice yourself, but being asked to sacrifice something that will deeply hurt someone else is a completely different thing. It brings more emotions, brings more internal conflict. You know, imagine that. It's like you having to tell your wife that, hey, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm just going to go kill our son. God told me to. Can you imagine how that conversation went? You know, and in the scripture, it's actually a little funny insult, uh, a little uh, funny insight where Abraham gets up early in the morning. So maybe Sarah was sleeping in that day. So he got up early to avoid any confrontation with her. But let's look into what specifically was Abraham willing to sacrifice. Genesis 21 verse 1 says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, and as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham uh, gave the name Isaac to, his son, to the son Sarah had born him. When his son was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. So here, Abraham and Sarah, his wife Sarah, they were so old beyond childbearing age. You know, in recent history, the oldest person to ever give birth was like 56, 57. And even that, that's like a miracle, right? But double that, 100 years old. They would have given up the idea of ever having a child. But God made them a promise to Abraham that he would have a son and that his son would live on to have so many descendants that you can't count them. In Genesis 20, uh, 17, it talks about how there's so many stars in the sky, so much sand on the seashore, you can't count them, so will be your descendants. So it was so much more than just him sacrificing his son, as if that wasn't enough. You know, why was Abraham so willing to sacrifice his own son? God's promise to him, his future, and even his wife's dream. You know, because we don't read in the Bible that he fought with God over this. It's not like God said, hey, sacrifice your son for me. And he said, no, God, you don't understand. You gave me this promise. I have my son. I'm not going to sacrifice him. You don't hear him saying things like, God, no, no you've, you've misunderstood the situation. You're not talking to me. You're talking to that Abraham in the other town. God, you wouldn't understand. If I tried to kill my son to sacrifice him for you, my wife would kill me first. You don't hear him saying these things, right? You just see Abraham obeying God. Hebrews 11 verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So get this, right? The reason why this huge test from God wasn't a big thing for Abraham was because Abraham's faith in God was greater than anything else in his life. Can the same be said of you today? You know, when problems, tests, situations, when life happens to you and you don't know the answer, do you have faith in God that He will provide for you? You know, if you're uncertain about certain things in the future, who's going to be my leader? What's going to happen to the brother's household that's ending in two months? What's going to happen to my visa? Anything in life that is uncertain, you must understand that the only thing certain in life is that God is alive and that He will provide a solution to you if you are faithful to Him. You know, I think about the times in my own life where I've stayed faithful to God, to God despite the pressure of the moment and God provided a solution for me. I think about this one time in our 2022, I think it was, Liz and I were renting this place in Redfern in Sydney. Nice. And then at that time in Sydney, all the houses were being taken. Wow. 
And so there were people going homeless because there wasn't enough houses for people. Plus, the rent was skyrocketing. It was like doubling or sometimes even tripling the rent. And so we went to our landlord and said, okay, he will increase the rent a bit. And we're like, okay, fair enough. That's better than going homeless. So we did it. We signed a new lease. And the day that we signed it, he said, actually, we're going to void that lease. I want to take back my place. And we're all like, what? He goes, yeah, you got to get out in two weeks time. And we're all like, whoa, are you serious? Like, what's happening here? And we were working full-time jobs and we had all this other stuff going on. And we went to even inspections where there was, I'm not even exaggerating, there was like 200 people going for this one place. It was ridiculous, right? But then what happened was God came through to us. It was like the last couple days and we found this place. And you know, Liz and I, it's a bit funny too. Liz and I are employed as shepherds, right? And we found a place on Shepherd Street. (laughs) And so it was this like, uh uh-huh. Funny God, I understand you've got it under control. You know, I remember this one time back in uh, beginning of COVID. So Liz and I, we got to this new house and then I made a budget at the beginning of the year. I said, by the end of the year, I want to uh, save this amount of money. And then it got to about middle of the year. And I was like, okay, let's look at the uh, forecast for everything. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Where's it gone? Like, <laughs> what happened to my money? And then I remember I, had, I was uh, tempted then to lower my contribution to God. Because I was like, I can't increase my income. I can't lower my rent. My food is pretty much the same, like the bare minimum food. I don't transport because it's we're stuck in COVID. So I was like, what can I do? Well, I can lower my contribution and that will get it over the line. Yeah. And I was tempted for a day. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to stick it. I'm not going to lower it. I'm going to be faithful to God. And then that week, I was contacted by my old job who said, I'm really sorry. We underpaid you a whole bunch of money. Let's pay this back with interest. <laughs> and I remember that I was like, wow, okay. And then a couple of years later, it happened to us again. <clears throat> now, I also remember my first job when I was about six months old as a Christian. And uh, I was working at this good job and it was a great job. I was, I was working uh, as a disability employment consultant. And it was prestigious. I was, I was getting, uh, you know, I was very successful in my job. I was good at it. Yeah. But then I remember that it was my job was taking me away from the kingdom. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Like I could see my life going down my career path, yeah. getting money and being happy and satisfied. Or I could see my life, my spiritual life with God just diminishing if I gave it up for that. Yeah. And so I remember I made a decision. I was like, I'm just going to quit. Yeah. I don't have a, a job to go to. That's okay. God will provide for me. And then I went to church on midweek and then so happened. It was like that week I got a job at the University of Sydney, which then God gave that to me because I knew the person who knew the person and all that stuff all through the church, by the way. But then God also doubled my pay. And I remember that I was like, wow, that's pretty cool, right? (laughs) But all these moments in my life, where I didn't have the solution to my problems. All I did was stay faithful to God and he provided the solution for me. You know, Abraham had so much faith that his faith produced a solution that mirrored God's plan for salvation for the world. Get this guys. So Jesus was sacrificed at a place called Golgotha, right? Abraham, we'll read the scripture in a second. But he was going to sacrifice his son at a place called Mount Moriah. Now, according to scholars, Golgotha and the ancient site of Mount Moriah were the same place. So it's like Mount Moriah is like Victoria Peak, right? And then HKU is down the bottom there, right? So Mount Moriah and then Golgotha is down the bottom there. It's the same place. In other words, Jesus was sacrificed at the same mountain that Isaac was going to be. This means that Abraham had so much faith in God that he started to think the same ideas as God. His faith produced a godly mindset. No, the only difference is where God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son, God did not spare Jesus at Golgotha. He let him be crucified. More to that, right? So the scripture says that Abraham even reasoned that God could raise people from the dead. Now, if you read the entire Bible, God actually raises people from the dead 
often. Like it's yeah. a few times in the New Testament, Jesus, even happened with uh, Samuel, even happened with Elijah sometimes. But Abraham was the first person in the Bible to think of this concept. No one told him, but his faith produced this idea that God can do anything, even raise the dead. See, Abraham's faith was bigger than his problems. And remember, when we read the Bible, we see it says clearly that God was testing Abraham, right? So we read it from the point of view of like, we know that the story is going to be okay because it's just a test, right? He's not actually going to kill his son or anything. God doesn't want to harm a child. But Abraham didn't know this was a test. To Abraham, this was a reality. He's like, I've got to do this. I either keep my son, disobey God, or I obey God and have faith. Those are my choices. You know, when God tests us, He already knows the answers. He's just checking to see if we know the answers too. The answer to every test that you faith that you have is to have faith. So maybe you're going through a test right now and you don't know what the solution is. Or maybe you just passed the test. Or maybe you just failed the test. Understand there will be more tests in life from God. And what you must realize is that if you stay faithful to God during the test, God will come through for you. You know, the title of today's sermon is God will provide. Let's go to point number one. God knows what he is doing. Starting in Genesis 22 verse 1. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He went out and had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. And he set out for the place God had told him about. You know, so again, it says here that God tested Abraham. By God testing Abraham, he wanted to know what was in his heart. Because when you test people, when you go to university, most of you are students or were students, you get tested to know what's in your brain, what you memorize, right? What you've learned, what you paid attention to, what you haven't paid attention to. The thing about God is when he tests you, he tests you to see what's in your heart. You know, understand that God is omnipotent, meaning that he knows everything. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Which means that your private thoughts aren't so private. Your feelings and your intentions aren't a secret anymore. And what you think no one else knows, God knows. You know, God knows who you really are inside. God knows what you are also capable of. Whether it's great faith or great sin. You know, He sees through everything that we think other people can't see through. Imagine this. You can come to church today. You can dress really nice. You can put some perfume on. You can brush your hair and brush your teeth. You can come in with a big smile. You can even come early to church. It does not mean that you are spiritually healthy. <laughs> you know, imagine that. Someone comes to the church. They look nice. They smell nice. They're smiley. They're happy. It's like, wow. You look at them. You're like, this guy is awesome. He's close to God. Yeah. What God sees is the reality. Yeah. He sees that this happy, smiley person missed their quiet time this morning. Ooh. Or has sin in their heart that they haven't confessed or haven't gotten over yet. Yeah. Or has a bad attitude and that's why they're so happy and smiley. Because they people please and they fear people more than God. Yeah. You know, you can easily fool people, but you cannot fool God. Yeah. Which is why the Bible says that God cannot be mocked in Galatians 6 verse 7. You know, when God is testing you, do you have the faith to pass the test? You know, we've got to understand, why does God test us? You know, we see Abraham, he's living his life. He just got his son. Why does God need to test him? God tested Abraham not to trip him up and watch him fall, not to entertain God and the angels in heaven, but to deepen Abraham's capacity to obey God and thus develop his character. You know, just as fire refines ore to extract precious metals, or how pressure forms lumps of coal into diamonds, God refines us through difficult circumstances and tests. And you know what? No one likes that. 
No one likes a test, right? And so a very, actually it's a very rare person that likes a test. I know if you guys have ever been there, but you're in a classroom and the teacher forgets that they said there was a test that day. And then someone reminds the teacher. It's like, oh, just, okay. You know, but why do you want to test me, right? You can say that to God. Well, it's because God wants to use you. You know, when we are tested, we can either complain, we can shrink back, we can run away from God, or we can have faith in God and try to see how God is stretching us to develop our character. You know, and it may be hard to see in that moment, but you need to pass the test to realize what God was teaching you. You need to realize that God has a purpose in everything He does. You know, we also got to understand that everything in life is a test. Every single thing in life is a test. Because everything in life is either sent from God directly or He allows to happen to us. Right? The only thing we can do is respond well to it. The only thing that matters is going to heaven. So if you have the mindset like Abraham, like, okay, test, challenging circumstance, but how can I please God? How can I have faith? How can I be obedient so that I can go to heaven? You know, when you become a disciple, you become a Christian, right? But you cannot become more saved. (coughs) You can just become better at saving other people. And a good analogy to help you understand this is like when I got married to Liz, the day that I got married to Liz, March 15th, 2018, 2019. (coughs) That very day, I became a married man. Uh I cannot now become more married. I can just become a better husband. Hence why God has tests to grow our character. You know, how do you respond to tests in your life? Do you become a victim and blame other people for your hardship that you're going through? Do you cower back from the challenges and not grow and mature yourself? Do you fall into sin when the pressure comes on and become even further away from God? Or do you remain faithful to God, focusing on how He can provide a solution for you, rather than how big your problem is? See, understand, no matter how big your test is, God is bigger. Do you believe that? Do you have the belief that God can get through anything in life? You know, let's see how Abraham responded to God's test in Genesis 22, verse 3. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out from the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go with the boy over there. We will worship and then we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. He, carried, he himself carried the fire and the knife. <coughs> As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the wood and the fire is here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. <coughs> and the two of them went on together. So get this, right? So Abraham, how did he respond to God's challenge? The first thing he did was he got up early in the morning in verse 3, right? He didn't shrink back from the challenge. No, he responded to God's test immediately. He didn't stay in bed pondering the circumstances, what he could do. No, he just obeyed God. This shows that he was eager to obey God, right? When I think of eager disciples or someone who is zealous, I think of Nikkei. You always see when she greens good news. H-K-U. It's like, oh. (laughs) It's crazy, right? (laughs) You know, I think about also uh, how he made this experience about worshiping God. Not about the sacrifice that he was about to make. He goes, no matter what, I'm going to worship God. In verse 5. You know, he focused on God not what he had to sacrifice for God. Yeah. It's like when we give our contribution, we should give it reluctantly. It's like, God, I want to give you this. 
If you give God something or you sacrifice God and it's like, God, I don't want to give you this, but here you go. God's like, just keep it. I don't want it. <clears throat> this shows that Abraham had a mindset that whatever the situation he was in, he would worship God. You know, understand, we don't just worship God on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., right, at the Oriental Center, 4.15. This is, we don't do that, right? We worship God every single moment and minute of our life. A true God worshiper will do everything for the sake of glorifying God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. It says, so whatever, so whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. See, no matter what you were doing, people should know that you worship God. Or would it be a surprise if you asked them to come to church? You know, I think about Candace in this situation. You know, Candace invites her neighbor. She came last week and the week before. But you, you understand that Candace is someone, it's even look at Candace. It's like, wow, there's something different about Candace. Right? She's not this standard person. No, she has the Holy Spirit. People don't understand that, but it's like something different about her, right? <clears throat> the other thing Abraham did was he had faith that God would provide the solution as long as he remained faithful in verse 8. You know, God will always provide, but people will not always have faith in God. Luke 18 verse 8, it says, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The sad reality is no, he won't find that much faith. But we can please God when we have faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. See, the same way that Abraham dealt with this test is the same way that we should deal with situations and tests that we find ourselves in. When we get bad news, when we find out something that's like shocking, it's like, wow, what do I do in this situation? Yeah. Or you find yourself in a problem with no solution. Mm. You need to get up early. You need to worship God mm. and you need to have faith that God will provide for you. Come on. Come on. Point number two wow. says you just need to obey and have faith. Come on. You know, let's carry on in Genesis 22 verse 8. Come on. Come on. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Yeah. It won't be you, <laughs> in other words. <laughs> And the two of them went on together. They reached the place that God had told him about. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out with his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Uh-oh. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son from me, your only son. Abraham looked and there was in the thicket. He saw a ram caught by, by its horns. He went over there and took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day on the mountain of the Lord, it is said it will be provided. Wow. What, can you imagine this, right? So here we find Abraham. He obeyed God's command. Yeah. But just for a second, imagine this from Isaac's point of view. <laughs> Poor little Isaac. <laughs> right? <laughs> this little kid just obeying his father. At what moment do you, realize, do you think he realized he was the sacrifice? When he was like saying, hey, you know, you got the knife, fire, wood. Where's the sacrifice, dad? <laughs> Abraham's like, it's okay. God will provide it. Yeah. You know, why don't we read that he ran away or that he pleaded with his dad to stop this madness? Because I think maybe Abraham keep re reassuring his son that God will provide. We read in the scripture, it's like, where's the sacrifice? God will provide it. You know, I don't think they walked up there in silence either to the mountain. But imagine it, right? They're walking up there. He goes up the hill, fire, wood, you know, uh, sword. Where's the sacrifice? God will provide. Goes, okay. All right. Walks up there and he goes, he finds the place. No sacrifice. Sure, Dad. And he looks over at Abraham and say, 
God will provide. It's okay. God will provide. It's all right. Don't worry about it. And so they build the altar. And he goes, all right, well, the next step is to bound the sacrifice. You see a sacrifice? It's okay, son. God will provide. And then he sees his dad turn his back and come with a piece of rope. Ties his hands, ties his feet, picks him up, put him on the altar. And he's looking at his dad like, uh, dad, <laughs> I, I'm not a sheep. And his dad says, it's okay, son. God will provide. Then he sees his dad pick up the knife and walk over to him. And maybe he's sweating a bit here, right? But then his dad raises the knife in the air. And I guess at this point, he's like, I'm done for. Like, oh my goodness, I'm the sacrifice. <laughs> right? But then imagine Abraham reassuring him the entire time. It's okay, son. God will provide. Wow. You know, maybe this is the reason why we don't read in the scripture how upset Isaac was or how he fought or argued with his dad to save his life. Because you see, maybe Abraham's faith exploded and poured into his son Isaac. See, when you have faith, you inspire others around you to have faith also. You know, when the angel from heaven spoke to them and God provided the ram in the thicket, like think about it. They were up there for a while, building things and preparing. Why didn't they see the ram before? It's because it wasn't there. But imagine how faith building this moment would have been for Isaac. Imagine that. He's like thinking, my dad's a nutcase. He's going to kill me. And then he gets saved just as his dad and his faith said, right? And he's like, wow, maybe I doubted before. I thought my dad was crazy, but now I'm full of faith. I understand in my heart that God will provide. You know, who are you inspired by? Think about people who are inspiring you because of their faith. We all read the Bible, right? We get inspired from the characters in the Bible. But who is a real life Bible character to you? Another question is, who are you inspiring? You know, we should have faith that comes from reading the message. Romans 10, 17. But if you're not reading the message, you don't have faith. You don't have faith. How can you inspire people to study the Bible? You know, we need to have so much faith that it overflows into other people's lives. We need to share our faith with them. You know, God provided a ram to be sacrificed instead of Isaac. And again, we see that God was only testing Abraham to see what was in his heart. And what God saw what was in his heart was that Abraham had deep faith and a conviction on obeying God, no matter what. What's in your heart though? You know, if God opened you up, took out your heart and had a look at it, what would he find? Would he find it wrapped up in sin or like, you know, secret compartments that you don't share about? Or would he be disappointed or would he be really happy with you? You know, understand that God blesses those who have faith and obey him. In Genesis 22, carrying on to verse 15. It says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. (coughs) Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations will be blessed because you obeyed me. You see, because of Abraham's obedience, he was able to see the blessing from God. If he had failed to obey God, he may potentially have missed out on that blessing. You see, God loves people who obey him. It's his love language, right? Some people, physical touch, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service. God's love language is obedience. You know, 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. It says, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as, is, as in obeying the Lord? Yeah. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Mm-hmm. Right? Obedience is God's love language. First John 2 verse 3, it says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Yeah. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands yeah. is a liar. Wow. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. 
Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Again, God's love language is obedience. You know, I think about there's so many disciples that obey God. And I can only imagine God looking down and it makes him happy. You know, Ryan is sick, unfortunately, today. But he came to midweek, right? But he had an assignment due that night that he was stressing on about. And he texts Alfred and he texts me. He's like, I don't know what to do. Maybe I should stay home and finish it. Or maybe I should come. But he made the choice to come to midweek. He, he made the choice to come to midweek despite the fact that he had that assignment due. Yeah. See, that makes God happy. Come on. You know, I think about Marcus and Jennifer. <coughs> you know, uh, they came up here for communion, did a fantastic job. Yeah. But Marcus and Jennifer and also other people who do ushering, right? Yeah. That makes God happy. Why? Yeah. Because the Bible commands us to serve one another. Right. What's ushering? Serving each other. Yeah. But they do it wholeheartedly, and this pleases God. You know, I think about shiny. Every single sermon, right? You know, think about how much that she makes God happy. You know, the Bible says that a quiet and gentle spirit is something that is valuable to God. And that is shiny. You know, she's incredibly serving and super helpful. That makes God happy. The question is, do you make God happy with your level of obedience and faith? Yeah. Now, in conclusion, the title today is Abraham, God will provide. Point number one, God knows what he is doing. There is tests in life. There is challenges. There is hardships. But understand, God knows what he's doing. And point number two, you just need to obey and have faith to see the blessing. And amen.